So this is a talk, um, I've modified it a little bit, but this talk I've been giving as um, a part of my um, Atlantic uh, Geoscience um, Society seminar tour um, through Atlantic Canada. So if you've been to one of those seminars, um, it's gonna be quite similar, um, but I'm really happy and excited to um, share some of this stuff with um, all of our friends in the other parts of Canada. So first of all, if we're talking about structural inheritance and the role of structural structural inheritance in the Northern Appalachians. The uh, first thing we probably need to understand is what is structural inheritance? So structural inheritance, um, when I say that, what I'm basically referring to is pre-existing basement structures that have an influence on later structures or later deformation events. So as you can see here, if you can see my uh, mouse, um, these would be uh, pre-existing faults or shear zones are heterogeneities in the Earth's crust. So they become zones of weakness um, that are prone to reactivation um, under certain um, stress regimes. So when I'm referring to structural inheritance in the Appalachians, what I'm really referring to is any pre-orogenic structures. So the structures that existed uh, pre-building of the Appalachians. So those structures or pre-orogenic structures would be those generated during rifting. So we know pre-orogenesis, we had rifting and opening of an extensive ocean basin. So on a small scale, these structures would be normal faults and offset by um, offset and accommodated by these transfer zones um, here. To a larger degree, which I'm gonna kind of discuss on at the beginning part of my talk, also talking about the margins of those basins. Um, so the regular geometry or margins of an extensive ocean basin due to the complex geometries of these fault systems. So the Appalachians, so many of you are probably familiar with maps like this. So the Appalachians extend um, from the Southern US all the way through Canada, through Newfoundland, across the Atlantic Ocean into its European counterpart, um, the Calidonides. And these maps, um, if you've seen color strip or ribbon maps like this, um, are really useful for origin scale correlations. So they divide the origin into different zones. So these zones are regions of um, that have shared stratigraphic and tectonic um, tectonic history. So that you can say, you know, these blue rocks here are correlated with, you know, blue rocks in Scotland. So um, they can be quite uh, useful. Um, and then we can also divide the origin into um, kind of group these zones into realms where we have the Laurentian realm, which are basically regions that have always been part of the Craton Laurentian and everything else that's exotic to Laurentian. So largely in the Northern Appalachians, that's zones of Gondwanan affinity. So similarly, we also have these boundaries that can be tracked across um, the origin that separate these different zones. So these are useful um, for origin scale correlations and we've been using them for um, a very long time. But we, what we'd like to argue um, and what we've argued in um, the last paper that we put out that this first part of the talk is largely based on is that these um, boundaries are quite time transgressive. So by using um, maps like this for correlation, you lose a lot of um, resolution in distinct and discrete events and episodes that are happening in different places along the origin. So this variability that we see, which I'll also hope to show you in this talk, is largely a function of the inherited of in inheritance within, um, within the origin. So our first step um, that we want to do is we want to look at the northern Appalachians. So we're going to zoom in here to um, New England uh, through Newfoundland to this region right here. So just to give you an idea about what the colors actually are, the blue rocks are those um, deformed Paleozoic rocks of Laurentian affinity. And then everything else in color, so green, pink, and brown, these are zones or terrains of exotic Gondwanan affinity or accreted to the Laurentian margin during various phases of Virgenesis, resulting in the Taconian, Selenian, and Acadian orogeny as the Iapetus Ocean, um, as the Iapetus Ocean closed. So maybe I'll just back one more here. So what I'm going to focus on in this talk is largely revision events. So largely what we refer to as the Taconian orogeny. And what we want to look at is how those events um, are affected by pre-existing structures. So in order to understand that, we need to know what happened prior to building of the Appalachians. So 
prior to Appalachian building, well, we had a supercontinent, Rodinia, and that supercontinent broke up and it broke up and then separated into these three large parts here, which were separated by this ocean, Iapetus Ocean. So we have Laurentia, Gondwana, and Baltica, and our Iapetus intervening ocean in between. So Rodinia breakup, ocean opening, and then consequential formation, the Laurentian margin. This is important to understand the Laurentian margin because this is the tapestry that the origin was built on. So we want to know the effect that these, the craton's shape had on later mountain building events. So this tapestry is actually quite complex. So this is a map from Thomas in 1977, and it is a bit oversimplified in geometry, but it really gets the main picture across. You have this series of normal faults offset these transfer faults, and some are quite major, like this one here in the Northern Appalachians, um, and down here in the Wichitas, and then some are not, um, not as significant. As you can see, it creates quite an irregular uh, margin um, geometry. And what we're really focused on is this region here, because this is where, this is the margin or the part of the Laurentian margin that the Appalachians, or the Northern Appalachians, I should say, were built upon. So you can imagine that it was probably quite a complex geometry, maybe something like this, again, depicted in a more simplified version by um, Alan Adele, uh, here where you can see a um, series of normal faults offset by these major transfer zones. So looking at the origin on a large scale, that sinuous geometry, and this is what Thomas proposed, is actually a reflection of that inherited geometry of the margin where you're getting that sinuous geometry, basically a function of these major promontories and embayments that existed here along the Laurentian margin. So you can imagine that promontories are regions on the crate, major regions on the craton that jutted out into the ocean. And then we have our embayments, which are basically like giant craton scale cove, you can imagine. So that sinuous geometry or the geometry of the origin itself is actually a function of inheritance. It's inherited from the original um, rifted margin geometry, which is really cool, um, really cool in itself. Um, we also know to, uh, to a degree that we also see diachrony in the major orogenic events due to this inherited rifted geometry as well, where the earliest collisions people have interpreted would have occurred first at the part jutting out the promontory and the later collisions would have occurred in the embayment. So we know this to a broad or general degree. However, in Newfoundland, some of the more recent work has shown that things are actually a little bit more complicated even than that, with the recognition of this off-margin microcontinental block. And here we call it the Dashwoods block. So during rifting, we also had severing of these Laurentian microcontinents in Newfoundland. And our question is, we see the same thing within the embayment. And if so, it would likely be exposed in these Laurentian massifs, which are now in the Peri-Laurentian realm. And perhaps they once existed as a part of a large block or maybe multiple blocks that were severed as well from the Laurentian margin. So some people have proposed that the these massifs represent windows to these blocks and others suggest that um, no, they were always part of Laurentia. But up until this point in time, there was no clear evidence to say yay or nay to, to either. So it's been quite controversial. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through um, the time step of events from Cambrian to Ordovician that we have uh, been able to constrain fairly well from the work done in Newfoundland. So I, write, I wrote down here, not so simple, and I wrote that because not like our classical model that we envision of the Taconian orogeny that's often taught um, in classes. You can get it, look at it on Wikipedia of just arc, continental collision, the arc collides um, with uh, the Laurentian craton, where you can see that that microcontinental block actually creates quite a bit of complexity. So... We had our opening of the Iapetus Ocean and severing of a microcontinental block from Newfoundland, setting up already a complicated picture. Then, at some point, we know that subduction had to initiate because that ocean is going to eventually want to close. That arc that is formed does collide with 
the uh, with Laurentia. However, that earliest collision is on an offshore microcontinental block, that severed fragment, not the Laurentian craton. We know then that subduction has to step inwards. The seaway is going to eventually close. And that's when we get our alakathons, or our traditional view of the Taconian orogeny, placed on top of the Laurentian margin. Now, important to note for a little later in the talk, what this does is this places our foreland here of the Laurentian craton on the downgoing subducting plate. So the foreland is in pro arc setting. Now we know largely from the work in Newfoundland that subduction polarity eventually wanted to uh, switch directions, so it reversed underneath the Laurentian margin. And important to note, this then placed the foreland in upper plate or a retro arc setting. So as you can see, story that, or I should, well, I guess we all tell stories in geology. The story or the scene that's been set for the Taconian orogeny is actually quite a bit more complex due to this wrench in the works. So what about everywhere else? Is it that simple or is there a lot of other nuance due to this early, um, early history or this uh, irregular margin geometry and offshore microcontinental blocks? So is it this simple? Well, this is what we went out to, to try to determine. And we needed to do origin scale, an origin scale correlation in order to make these um, interpretations. And these sorts of studies are actually generally quite difficult. And they're difficult because there's inconsistencies in time scales. The time scales are constantly changing and being recalibrated. Um, tectonic nomenclature changes and stratigraphic nomenclature changes across provincial boundaries, and there's sparse geo geochronological data sets. So in order to do this, we actually had to collect all the biostratigraphic and isotopic data and place it on a common time scale. And like I mentioned, what I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on the Eacron through Ordovician events. So first of all, um, we had rifting and opening of the Iapetus Ocean, and we think we had development of a microcontinental block severed from the Laurentian margin in Newfoundland. And I'll go through that evidence in just a moment. But what first happened is that ocean's gonna start to close. And we can actually see evidence of that early arc everywhere along the margin at pretty much the exact same time, suggesting that there's an extensive Cambrian arc system that initiated outboard of Laurentia within um, the Cambrian. Now to get into some of that evidence to show those blocks were there. So in Newfoundland, we can see that earliest arc continental collision, so we had abduction of ophiolites and deformation and metamorphism of Laurentian rocks well in advance. So we had that happening well in advance of any signal in the passive margin. So the passive margin is just happily continuing to develop no major unconformities, there's no evidence of tectonism. So this deformation had to occur somewhere else, not on the craton. And actually we see the exact same stratigraphic evidence everywhere else in Quebec. You see the abduction of the um, uh, Southern uh, Quebec ophiolites and deformation of Laurentian rocks well in advance of destruction of the passive margin that's sitting happily forming on the craton to the West. And similar, sorry about that, we see the same thing in New England. The earliest collisions, our, con our continental collision occurs well in advance of destruction of the passive margin that's still forming on the craton. So this would suggest that deformation had to occur somewhere else off margin, likely on an offshore microcontinental block. Now, the earliest collisions occurred first in the Ferungian. So that Earliest deformation is actually not Ordovician, but it's Cambrian um, in Newfoundland, and it occurs later, uh, about 10 to 12 million years later in Quebec and New England. And this is a direct reflection of inheritance where earliest collisions are happening at the promontory and later collisions happening in the embayment. And those collisions are actually happening on offshore microcontinental locks. So we have to consider this wrench in the works when we move forward with our model. We can't ignore it. Things are not as simple as Wikipedia um, has us believe. So let's move forward. Uh, let's keep moving forward through time. So with our continental collision, you had development of the earliest flish basins. And similarly, you see the exact same time steps. Oldest rocks deposited in Newfoundland first, a little bit younger in Quebec, and then even younger still 
in New England. Again, direct reflection of that margin geometry. Sediments are older, promontory, younger, the embayment to those collisions. Now, really interestingly, if you look at some of uh, the provenance studies that have been done, is we have a conspicuous um, presence of detrital chromite that's um, within the Flish basins in Newfoundland and Quebec. And this has been shown um, for quite a long time, I think since um, the 70s. And this is some work here from Hiscock, others, um, others in New England. And they show conspicuous evidence um, of an ophiolitic source. However, then New England, in New York, there is a conspicuous lack of chromite that you see everywhere else in these earliest flish basins. So if we think about what's actually happening at the time, this does make complete sense. Where Newfoundland and Quebec are earliest are continental collisions are abduction, abduction of ophiolites onto those off-margin blocks. Where our earliest collision is actually a Gondwanan terrain in New England. So another little sliver or a microcontinent, but this time the other side of the ocean. So next step, our subduction is going to step within the seaway. And we have very good evidence to support as part of the model here, production of the Notre Dame arc, which has um, which has Laurentian isotopic signatures, um, Precambrian xenocrystic zircons, showing that that arc was built on Laurentian crust. Now we actually have evidence for this in New England, although it has not been interpreted this way or in um, this, uh, this model. So I'll get into that in a bit later. But we do have the conspicu conspicuous evidence to show that Laurentian crust is at depth, the same evidence is in Newfoundland, where we have those Laurentian isotopic signatures within what's called the Oliverian plutonic suite. So I'll get back to that in just a moment. But again, see that time step. Sorry. You see that time step, stepping in in the seaway, first on the, on the promontory, where you have that off-margin block rifted, and then much later in Quebec, and then later in New England. So finally, we'll get a lockathon emplacement onto the Laurentian margin. That seaway closes, and that creates what um, has been referred to as the peripheral bulge. And that's due to loading of the downgoing plate, um, causing um, lower plate uh, flexure. And that bulge will migrate through time and create an unconformity that migrates cratonwards. So in Newfoundland, that unconformity is well constrained and known as the St. George unconformity. In Quebec and New England, it is often referred to as the Knox Beekman Town unconformity. That's often referred to as the peripheral bulge unconformity. However, we would suggest that this is actually quite a minor unconformity. You have burrows crossing the boundary in places and adjacent biostratigraphic zones um, in many places as well. So what we would suggest is actually the base of the Black River is a much more extensive unconformity in some locations, like the Mohawk Valley actually takes out, moves everything down into the Floian, much more typical tectonically induced basin or unconformity, sorry. So again, and this follows with everything else that we've been seeing, that 10 to 12 million year time step from promontory to embayment. First it formed in the promontory, later in the embayment. So our foreland basin would have formed the Proarch Basin and the Laurentian crust subducting. But we know that eventually subduction polarity reversal did occur underneath the Laurentian margin, and that would transfer our basin a retro arc basin. And I'll get into why this is important for us in just a minute. So we have clear evidence of subduction polarity reversal in Newfoundland. We know that that West of subduction initiated quite early, but actually um, occurred underneath the Laurentian margin where reversal was complete by about 460 million years. And this is largely due to the work that we know this from the work of Alex Zagorevsky and Case Van Stahl, that reversal was complete by this time. Things are a little bit more fuzzy in New England um, and Quebec. So they have a lot of, in Quebec in particular, there's a lot of younger um, overlying rocks covering stuff, covering the old stuff up. In New England, things are really deformed and metamorphosed. So it's kind of harder to untangle some of this stuff. But subduction polarity reversal has been interpreted for quite some time to actually have occurred around the exact same time that we know that it happened in Newfoundland. 
plan. So about 460 million years old, 460 million years. And we think that those interpretations are largely based on the Oliver and Plutonic suite, which has conspicuous Laurentian isotopic signature, signatures. So to fit this into the model, we switched production polarity and to say, okay, it had to be under Laurentian crust, Laurentian craton. With the knowledge that we have an off-margin microcontinental block, there's no need to switch subduction polarity, and we can just step that subduction zone inwards. And we can actually use evidence from the four-line basin to show that this is likely actually what's occurring. So we don't think that subduction polarity reversal occurred at the same time in Quebec and New England as it did in Newfoundland. We think that it was later, like all the other events. So looking at our four land basins, we have Proarc Basin or Retroarc Basin. Our Proarc Basin is formed on the undergoing or down thrust lithosphere. The key characteristics are that it has a very fast subsidence rate, um, short lived, but it has accelerating subsidence as shown by this nice subsidence curve here. It's in a schematic. And our Retroarc Basin, which would have been the foreland when subduction polarity reversal occurred on the upper the upper or overriding plate has actually a much slower subsidence rate. It has a more protracted history. So what does this mean for us? Well, we know that subduction polarity reversal occurred this time in Newfoundland, around 460 million years. And if we go with the estimates in New England and Quebec, it would have occurred in this window of time right here. That implies that, our four, that the foreland basin, our first foreland basin sediments above the peripheral bulge on conformity in a retroarch, not a proarch setting. That means they should have retroarch characteristics, which they do not. Subsidence rates are incredibly high, much too high to be a retroarch basin. So if you look at the subsidence curves, you can see from this window of time, 450, 460 here, we, they're all showing accelerated subsidence, exactly what you would predict for ProArc basin. So these are ProArc four-line basins. Subduction polarity reversal had not occurred at the same time as it did in Newfoundland. It occurred after, probably around 10 to 12 million years after, like we saw the delay in all of the other tectonic events that we've been able to recognize. So this is actually not um, uncommon or odd for subduction to be in multiple polarities along a margin. We're actually in, you can see this example here in um, Australia along the North Australian Craton, where we have subduction along the New uh, Guinea Trench, where reversal has already occurred. And that's at the promontory. Within the embayment along the Timor Trough, subduction polarity reversal has not occurred yet. A direct reflection, this margin geometry of promontory and embayment. If you actually look, a mirror image of um, the northern part of Australia here, you can imagine this is very similar to, this, to um, the shape, the margin that we um, recognized uh, within Eastern Laurentia to affect all those tectonic events. So instead of those simple 2D cross sections, they can be valuable, but we argue that maps are definitely the way to go when you're looking at things, different things happening, but at the same time along the margin. So you can see that in the Neoproterozoic to Cambrian, we had development of this irregular margin, the rifting of these off-margin microcontinental blocks, and all of these features are going to affect later tectonic events. So in the Frangian in Newfoundland, we had earliest arc continental collision. Farther south, we had just development of that arc um, with no collisions. Then in the embayment, getting a stepping in of that subduction zone into the seaway, we're just getting our initial arc continental collisions down here within the embayment in Quebec and New England. Seaway is closing in Newfoundland. However, um, subduction zone is just starting to step into the seaway um, inboard of that block within the embayment. And finally, we get subduction polarity reversal occurring first at the promontory that hasn't yet occurred in the embayment. So as I guess um, for the first part of this talk as some major conclusions is that this, the geometry of the entire origin itself is inherited from the original margin geometry, that sinuous shape. And then 
all of those tectonic events. So collisions, four land base, the development of four land basins, the geometry of those basins, the reversal and subduction polarity, the diachronity that we see, all of those events are directly affected by this irregular merge in geometry and the positions of these off margin microcontinental blocks. But what about a smaller scale? So we actually have shown from our work in Western Newfoundland that it also, that these inherited structures also significantly affect the structural style within the origin. And we know um, that this is likely to occur because these structures are structures prone to reactivation. They're heterogeneities within the Earth's crust um, and they're zones of weakness. If they can be reactivated, they want to be. So if we zoom in here to some of the our work that we've done in Western Newfoundland, specifically in the Laurentian realm, just a brief overcap of the geology here that we're looking at. We have oldest rocks are Mesoproterozoic, Granvillian rocks. And we know that these were overlain by our extensive, uh, predominantly carbonate shelf succession. The Iapetus was um, alive and thriving. And then know that our first uh, phase of tectonism, the Taconian orogeny, eventually led to production of alochthons on top of um, on top of the margin. As we had the advancing origin um, moving and migrating, we had material shed from that origin into the developing foreland basin. And that's represented um, right here, just above our peripheral bulge unconformity. So our St. George unconformity in Newfoundland, that is the base of the foreland and the first instance of tectonism within the basin. So we talked about formation of the peripheral bulge as that lower plate was flexed due to loading of the origin, but we also can show that that bulge or that area or the down going plate, I should say, is also being highly extended, maybe due to flexure, but likely predominantly due to slab pull. And we're getting development of these major normal, uh, normal basement involved faults. And we have stratigraphic evidence to show that these were forming at the time of the Taconian orogeny. That's by the development of these major fault scarp deposits. So these polymictic conglomerates that contain clasts that are derived from the platforms and they are deposited into developing foreland. So they're interbedded with the oldest flish sediment. So these are not little idly piddly faults. Some of them are small, but some of them uh, in particular in Newfoundland show up to kilometer relief. So these are really extensive um, large-scale faults. And if we look down here on the port of port Peninsula, we're going to look at a couple of these major basement faults. The thing with these conglomerates are they are always in the immediate hanging wall of major basement-involved faults. And we're going to look cross-section here across one of those major structures here, roundhead fault. Here's the seismic line across this section right here. And here's the interpreted seismic. You might be asking yourself or questioning what you're seeing. Yes, it is a major reverse fault. It is not a normal fault. But that fault scarp deposit is now in the hanging wall of a major basement involved thrust fault. And its erosional bevel is actually pitched in seismic down here. So this is basically telling us that the, this fault in particular began its life as a major normal fault. And then in the Taconian during Laurentian lower plate um, extension, and then was inverted during the probably Acadian orogeny, which we can constrain um, fairly well from cross-cutting and stratigraphic relationship. So they have these major basement involved faults showing at least two phases of motion, normal motion in the Taconian, reverse motion in the, in, um, the Acadian. So let's move farther north um, in Laurentia, in Western Newfoundland and to my mapping project, um, large part of my mapping project in my PhD. So this is the region here uh, shown. Um, I, we have our Taconian Alakathon here. We have our platform sediments and our basement. And one thing to note here that the major structure has always, or I shouldn't say has always, but for a long time been viewed this fault here, the long range thrust, founding movement from sedimentary rocks. So these initial interpretations were shown in cross section, looks something like this, where the thing to note on this section is that the 
platform, and the basement is largely autochthonous and has not been transported any significant distance. And this fault here, the Parsons Pond Thrust, quite insignificant in these interpretations. Now, if we move along another line further south and look at some of the initial interpretations in this region, here we actually see just the platform and basement brought to the surface and exposed east of the Alakathon, generally just by large scale broad folding and a wedging of basement beneath the platform. So, no major faulting. This is generally due to basement wedging and folding of the platform up to the surface. So these are the previous interpretations. So what we suggested coming into this is the Parsons Pond thrust is likely the major fault in this area, largely because these sediments are platform sediments. These ones are slope and rise sediments, two different depositional um, environments. These, this section here is just a nice stratigraphic section, not super deformed. Here we have sediments deformed in a duplexes. They're stacked, they're folded. It's quite complex. So if we look at the seismic line coming along up here, this is the seismic with some ref major reflector shown, and this, this is our interpreted section. So big thing you can see is that platform and basement actually transported a significant dis distance in the region. So they're not completely autochthonous. They have been transported. And if you walk out to the coast, you actually see major polymic conglomerates or these fault scarp conglomerates in the immediate hanging wall this fault, suggesting again that this major fault began its life as a normal fault and was later reactivated as a major basement involved thrust fault. So, if you move further south to some of the sections um, that I did uh, with this map, you can actually see that the structural scenario is actually quite a bit more complex. In that basement, yes, has been transported a significant distance upwards of 13 kilometers, and that the basement in this area is actually exposed in the core of these ma major fault propagation folds. So structurally very different. And in the immediate hanging wall of these, um, these the Parsons Pond Thrust, everywhere I have mapped, see fault scarp conglomerate, indicating that it began its life as a normal fault and was later averted significant displacement. So this is structurally analogous to what we see on port to port. So we actually have a likely Acadian thrust front, basement involved, actually is inverted and began its life as a normal fold. So this structural scenario um, is not, uh, not what we're actually looking at here. So this platform, this basement, actually transported a significant distance and it's not folded to the surface. So this is the structural scenario that we're looking at. And our question then is, do they even have a longer history? Were these faults active even before Taconian extension? And there is lots of evidence to show that. In seismic, we see evidence of these thickened rift-related grabbins. We also see evidence on land in mapping. We see these rift-related sediments below the platform in the direct or immediate hanging wall of these basement involved thrust faults. So these were actually likely um, likely active since Neoproterozoic New Cambrian rifting and opening of the Iapetus. And just as a point of interest, the geometry of the round head thrust in general is quite irregular and kind of has these 90 degree jogs, which when we think about that it's reactivating likely these rift related structures, that makes a bit more sense when we have um, these maybe are reactivating normal faults and these sections reactivating transfer zones before those um, connecting um, and accommodating those original normal faults. So in Newfoundland, we have a tectonic scenario where we have normal faults generated during rifting and opening of the iapetus, then they were reactivated during Taconian loading of the Laurentian margin and later inverted. So now my question is, is we see this situation other places along the Laurentian margin. If we have analogous structures, this significantly changes our understanding of the structure of the Laurentian realm in the Northern Appalachians. So in particular, what I'm gonna look at first is in Quebec and New England. Just as a note here, this red line is our predicted trace of where we would predict that inverted Acadian thrust front existed. This is where we're going to test C if this is likely an inverted um, inverted reverse 
it's been involved fault. All right, so zooming into this area, here's um, a map shows a lot of normal faults within the foreland. And these normal faults are all shown to be activated during um, Taconian, uh, Taconian or Genesis. And I have these stars here just to show you that in the immediate hanging walls of all of these faults right here, it's actually these polymictic conglomerates. And these polymictic conglomerates are actually impressive. They have class of the entire platform all the way down the Precambrian basement class. So these normal faults likely had scarps of maybe upwards of two kilometers relief on them. These were huge. So yes, there's evidence of extensive basement normal faults in the Taconian. Now the question is, we have analogous structures where we see some of these faults inverted like we do in Newfoundland and forming these major basement cord fault propagation folds. Well, Let's look at a couple of the massifs within the Laurentian realm would be likely candidates. So we'll zoom in here to Quebec. This would be our predicted position of that fault as it bounds the massif to the east and the allochthon to the west. So here's a cross section across here um, done by the mapping um, of Tremblay and Pinay. And here's their interpreted cross section. And you can see here that your allochthon sits in this sin form just folded to wedging of the basement underneath and the massif just brought to surface by large scale folding foaming. So no major transport um, along, no significant transport um, of basement involved um, thrust fault. So this is actually very similar, to this scenario here we have that we had in Newfoundland. Now, if we move a little bit further south, to where we had the these basement massif shown the Grenville, um, the Green Mountain Massif and the Berkshire um, Massif farther south. Here would be the predicted trace of where we might put that inverted thrust fault if it existed, where we have basement to the east, and we have Lockathon to the west. And this is the interpretation here um, done by um, Rat Ratcliffe and others, where again we see. The um, Lockathon brought to, uh, brought to surface and folded into this informal feature where the massif, sorry, is brought to the surface by um, booming and large scale folding. And the boundary between those two, I should note, is largely, um, it's, it's in a back thrust position, but it's largely a conian feature. It's not a large, um, it's not an Acadian feature. The doming folding is what's bringing really the massif up. Again, that's structurally analogous to some of these earlier interpretations, in Newfoundland and structurally analogous to what they've interpreted in Quebec. However, our question is, is, is it analogous to Newfoundland? So we actually need to start looking for evidence to show that these might actually be, um, first of all, thrust faults, and these thrust faults might be inverted. So just moving through the literature, some really interesting things that you know that right here at the boundary between Massif and Taconian Lockathon, you see the presence of this flish interbedded with a polymictic conglomerate. This is called the Ira Formation, which is a Utica goose tickle group equivalent. These are the oldest flish rocks, but they're interlayered with this polymictic conglomerate that contains class of the deeper platform. And the real interesting thing is that you only see this polymictic conglomerate on this side of the Massif doesn't fold over, you just see it right here. Now, these are analogous lithologically and in its position is also structurally analogous to what we see in Newfoundland. So moving across another position where we'd expect one of these maybe um, inverted faults to, uh, to exist here, and that would be this fault here at the, at the front of the origin, the Aston Fault. And here's an interpreted um, cross section by Como and others. And one interesting thing again is that this, these gray units here, these are the oldest flish rocks. In the immediate hanging wall here, you have what's been referred to as chaotic units, but it's a polymictic conglomerate. The clasts are lithologically, and some of them have biostratigraphic work done on them. They are derived from the platform. Um, and these are interbedded with the oldest, um, oldest flish. They've been in interpreted as tectonic melanges to maybe derived from sheets or thrust sheets of the Alakathon 
since it's been emplaced, many interpretations, but we think it could potentially indicate fault is basement involved, it began its life, the normal fault of those in Newfoundland. So the question is, is again, do we see evidence that these are e even older? So are these actually inherited structures, pre-orogenic structures? Well, if we look here at just a map, those fault systems here. So these are the Conian normal faults, all these dark lines here within the foreland. And we just look at a map that I, uh, that I pulled up from the uh, related dike swarms that are formed in Canada and within New York. And you can see that these dikes, and these dikes of the Grenville Dike Swarm, perfectly um, parallel those structures and even change uh, these, these normal faults actually change to perfectly parallel the Grenville Dike Swarm um, further up towards Montreal. So from orientation evidence, um, I, I would suggest, um, and these are rift related, uh, these are rift related rocks, dikes, that it's likely that they, these normal faults are probably um, uh, reactivating maybe these zones of weakness that were generated during emplacement of these dikes. So yes, what is next is we need to do the work. So that's where my research group is headed, get our boots on the ground and test We've read the papers, we know there's evidence there, now we need to look at it and see if these structures are actually analogous. Um, then another step that we're going to take on is we're actually going to try to get actual ages for movement on these faults. We have great relative ages, but we don't have actual ages. So we can collect calcite um, or carbonate silicon fibers from these regions. And in particular, there's many locations documented from normal faults within the Quebec foreland which have reverse sense silicon lines, so showing that they were inverted. So we have a pilot study happening now in Newfoundland, one of my undergraduate students, collecting detailed structural, um, collecting detailed structural uh, data um, along some of these features that I looked at in my PhD, and collecting and sampling these carbonate silicon fibers for UPB dating. And we have some initial results so far um, that actually say, yes, there has been reactivation. And in fact, some of these structures have been reactivated um, in the Carboniferous, so likely associated with um, the opening of the Maritimes Basin um, and even docking of uh, Maguma. So some really interesting stuff coming out of this pilot study. And just to kind of leave you here with uh, why do you care? Um, I care because it's super cool um, and changing models and rethinking new ideas is fun, like I'm sure you all love to do. Um, but from an economic perspective, these inverted faults that we've shown to be major basement involved inverted features are associated um, with, in particular, in southern the southern part of the front here in Port of Port, these structures are associated with proven petroleum traps, where wells have intersected um, uh, structures that trap petroleum, and then further up north, um, where these inversion in structures um, were not recognized up until this point in time. The Daniels Harbor conglomerate, which um, hosted, hosted um, a lead, a lead zinc deposits and where the Daniels Harbor mine was located, is actually an immediate hanging wall of one of what we know is a basement involved fault. So these faults have to be incorporated into these new models because we know that they exist now um, and hopefully will drive um, e exploration in a um, more positive direction to maybe find some more of these uh, types of deposits. So in conclusion, the inherited irregular margin geometry affected not only the large scale origin geometry, but all major tectonic episodes. And the structures that were inherited during this rifting had a protracted history. And in particular, we can show this in Newfoundland and that it greatly affects the deformation style that we see within the Laurentian realm. And it will have an important impact on future exploration within the Appalachian foreland um, and fold and thrust belt. So thank you very much. And I will accept any questions now. You have them, and I hopefully I didn't go over time. I did not look at my clock.